Good evening. You're looking at a live shot of the world's second large tallest buildings in the heart of New York City's financial district. At this hour, more than 500 rescue workers are there on the scene of a massive underground explosion that ripped through the World Trade Center just after noon today, killing five, injuring at least 500. Our guest is the former assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of New York. While currently a columnist for the National Review, he is better known for leading the fight against the blind shake, bringing he and 11 others to justice in the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. It's a pleasure to welcome Andy McCarthy to Midpoint. Andy, thank you so much for being here. Ed, pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. Andy, this still sends chills up the spine of a lot of us who lived in New York, lived in and around New York at the time, way back in 1993. Earlier in the show, I had a chance to talk to former New York State Governor George Pataki, and he said that he fears that we are now behind the curve, years later, that we have still not caught up to what we need to do in order to stop the terrorists from attacking American shores. Do you agree or disagree? I agree with Governor Pataki on that. I, I think, you know, what we know about this ideology and it's amazing that you know here we are 22 years later we're really s still talking about the same things precisely because we haven't really grappled with what causes the problem but what we know they need is safe haven to plot attacks against the United States and by my count they have more safe haven now than they had prior to 9-11 certainly more than they had prior to 1993 and I take to heart the words of uh, Jim Comey, the FBI director, who, uh, in, in announcing a, a new case just uh, yesterday, I think it was, said that uh, the FBI is pursuing these kinds of cases in all 50 states. He said, I have homegrown violent extremist investigations in every single state. All right, look, we're the United States. We're supposed to have more money, more intelligence, better people, better intelligence than anybody else around the world. From 1993 to today then, or to yesterday actually, when three Brooklyn men are accused of a plot to aid the fight in ISIS and they are arrested, how could we then allow ourselves to get so far behind the curve? What happened? How did we drop the ball? Well, we've dropped it by becoming actually worse since we were in 1993 at grappling with what causes uh, I Islamic extremism. Uh, you know, the, I, I've said probably every bad thing you can say about using the civilian criminal justice system as the point of the counterterrorism sphere, so to speak. Uh, let me say the one really good thing about it, which was back in 1993, in the four corners of our trial, no matter what they were saying in Washington or anywhere else, we were able to prove to the jury not only what happened, but why it happened, how this ideology catalyzed these terrorists to commit these atrocities. And what's happened, particularly uh, it, with greater speed in the last eight years, but it's hardly just a, an Obama administration problem, uh, it's been, become basically verboten for our law enforcement people, our, intelligent people, our intelligence people, and our military people to acknowledge that Islamic supremacism, this Sharia doctrine, uh, is what basically inspires all of the terrorism we've been dealing with for almost a quarter of a century now. Got a little over a minute. We'll take a break, come back and talk more. But before we do leave, is it your opinion then that unless we take off some of these politically correct shackles here one way or another, that we are going to see another 1993, another 2001, only this time it's going to be a whole heck of a lot worse? I think we do have to worry that it'll be worse because the simply as years go on, uh, the weapons get better from their perspective, and it just takes less and less people to project more and more power. Are we at a point, though, Andy, where we can actually allay the public's fears? Because we know what this causes here. People will say, we don't want the government in our business. We don't want too much government intrusion. We don't want you looking at every single corner here. So how do we allay their fears and still protect them? Well, if you're going to have people who are, uh, if you, well, the government. It's a tough question, to, I know. Yeah, the government has to conduct itself in a way that makes people think it's trustworthy so that they're comfortable with aggressive surveillance with the understanding that that'll, it'll be targeted at the right people. I, I think, unfortunately, this government's forfeited a lot of that trust. And unfortunately, having forfeited the trust, that means that we are right back at square one. We've got to start all over again. And this, of course, put more people's life in danger, which is the frightening thing. Andrew, please stand by just a couple of minutes here. We're going to take a break, come back and talk. And when we do return, we're going to deal from the legal side of things because we're going to use the words of President Obama 
immigration executive order and constitution in the same paragraph to dig out the facts in this latest Beltway bust out that's going on right now because it all comes down to whether or not the Department of Homeland Security will be forced to shut down tomorrow. And don't worry, that doesn't mean that everybody will be off and out of work immediately, but it comes down to constitutionality. Let's get some answers. We'll do that when we come back right here on Midpoint. Your attention, we get back to work with the former assistant U.S. attorney, a specialist in the law and counterterrorism, and columnist for the National Review, Andrew McCarthy. Andrew, we have to ask you a little bit on the legal side of things, what's going on in Washington right now, because frankly, the discourse, you can't seem to get an honest answer from anybody. One side says that the president is within his constitutional rights to issue an executive order. He has done it, and he stands firm on the immigration issue. The other side said it is completely against constitutional law, and the man must be held responsible. From your knowledge and from what we can gather, first of all, simply stated, was the president within his legal rights as the chief executive to issue his executive action order on immigration? No. Uh, and let me qualify that now that I've given the, the straightforward answer. There's different aspects to the order. As far as setting priorities for enforcement, there's no question that the president has what they call prosecutorial discretion. They can make enforcement priorities which, say, illegal aliens they want to go after in terms of deportation and the like. But the executive order also talks about positive legal benefits, things like work permits, social security numbers, and, and uh, registration and the like. Uh, those are things, adjustment of status, uh, that are only in Congress's purview, and the executive branch has absolutely no authority to issue them. Okay, then let's take it from the other side. If indeed it is an illegal action, which you have said it is, then right. did the Republicans, did the opponents take the right actions to fight it? And I guess Americans are going to ask, if it's illegal, then how does he get away with it? <laughs> well, well, no, they haven't taken any action to fight it. And as I've been saying for some time now, I wrote a book about it last year called Faithless Execution. The way our system is designed, um, you can impeach the president or you can use the power of the purse to deprive him of the funds he needs to carry out illegal activity. If you're not willing to do either of those two things, that's a political choice that can be made, but we don't have any other means in the system to really brush back uh, illegal activity by the executive branch. Then as the system is written, then what you've just said, it would then say to people that the Republicans are certainly within their legal rights and certainly is exactly what Congress should be doing in order to then tie some of the DHS funding to the immigration bill, correct? I, I think that's not only correct, I think there's not much on the other side other than their uh, being afraid of their own shadow at the press accusing them of being responsible for uh, a shutdown which actually would be a phantom shutdown because nothing would actually shut down. And to be perfectly honest, uh, the fact that you know a bunch of politicians, when they create an agency, hang a sign on it that says Department of Homeland Security doesn't mean that it's anything other than a bit player in Homeland Security. We still spend hundreds of billions of dollars on the FBI's uh, domestic security, uh, the FBI's overseas investigations, the military, the intelligence community, and the number one counterterrorism agency in this country continues to be the FBI, not the Homeland Security Department. Andrew, you just said something here that I haven't heard anybody else mention when they talk about the Department of Homeland Security. You called them a bit player. There are people right now saying that if this shutdown happens, America is in danger, that we will be less secure. And if you then hearken back to what happened in Brooklyn, certainly at this time, we need all the security we can get. But you're not that convinced, are you? It's a silly argument because even if you believed that the Homeland Security Department was crucial to our Homeland Security. The fact is that even in a shutdown, essential government employees would continue to come to work. The only thing that would happen is they wouldn't be paid. And I must tell you, having worked for the government for about a quarter century, uh, you do a lot of work in national security without being paid. That's not at all that unusual. Is the Department of Homeland Security then just a little bit of a... a I, I don't know, and I want to be very careful in how I choose my words here, but perhaps it's just not that important, or it's, or it's too many agencies, it's too bloated. Perhaps it's, it's something that maybe needs to be pared down then in the first place? 
The Department of Homeland Security was created right after the 9-11 attacks right. in the typical Washington uh, manner of politicians trying to show the public they were doing something uh, in response to an attack where the performance of the government in the lead-up to the attack had been incompetent. So what they did was they took uh, a bunch of agencies, and they uh, existing agencies, and they gathered them together and they put them under a new bureaucracy, which they called the Department of Homeland Security. But many of the agencies don't have anything to do with Homeland Security. And those that do have essential employees who, even if there were a quote-unquote shutdown, would continue to come to work. I only got about 20 seconds left. You used the word incompetent there a few moments ago. Is it fair to say then that some of the people in the Republican Congress right now are maybe a little bit incompetent in the way that they've handled this fight against the president? I wouldn't call it incompetent. I think that they've made a political calculation that, uh, and I do question their competence on this, that they are incapable of explaining to the public what I've just explained to you and therefore would be uh, politically damaged by the quote-unquote shutdown. We need to take what you just said and we need to repeat it over and over again because it comes from someone who knows from education and experience. Andrew McCarthy, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, Ed. I right, take care. There is little more important at the moment in American security than the battle waged against extreme terror. One-on-one -on -one with Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, next.